Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Diatom Web Academy. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are starting the recording now and everyone will be muted. Um, as you can see in the group chat, you can enter your name and location. Um, and we will send information about um, the recording of this webinar and the next uh, following webinar by um, email um, from the email list. And um, as you know, for those who've joined us before, we will be monitoring the chat window so you can enter questions in there um, at any point and we'll let the speakers know um, if there are any clarifying points that we need to make. And there will be time for questions at the end. Um, so with that, um, I'll turn it over to Sarah. Thanks, Sylvia. And um, welcome, everyone. I'd like to introduce our speakers, um, David Burge, who is a doctoral candidate at the University of Minnesota, and Mark Edland, who has, for his career, worked on a wide variety of paleolimnology, diatom life histories, ancient lakes, um, studies of the Great Lakes, and so today on their presentation on diatoms and paleolimnology, we're going to gain the experience of Mark Edland and the new insights of David Burge. So um, welcome everyone, thank you. All right, um, thank you, Sylvia. Can, can you hear and see me? Yep. Excellent, okay. Um, thank you all for, for your attention today, or if you're listening in the future to this recording, or I, hope, I hope you find it worthy of your time. Um, uh, what you see on the screen in front of you are, are three different things, although one of them may look like the border on the far left. You can see a, a vertical photograph of a, of a sediment core um, taken from a lake, and it could be any one of the lakes that you see in the, in the center of the video. And in the bottom right, um, it are, are some diatoms. And today we're gonna talk about bringing all three of these things together and how we can use the information we gain from them to, to manage lakes. Um, Mark and I would really quickly like to express some thanks to a few people, um, especially Sylvia and Sarah for all of their uh, personal time that they have put into both the Diatom Web Academy um, the taxonomic certification committee and I guess Sarah especially what you've done to, to make DONA a possibility um, we really appreciate that thank you um, and uh, one other person I'd like to thank is is one of our colleagues here in Minnesota Elena Thede who um, has artfully oh maybe I shouldn't say that uh, artfully uh, put together her her science and arts degree and helped us develop some of the uh, animations you'll be seeing in this talk today so thank you and next slide Oops. All right, so um, we kind of break this talk up into to three pieces. I'm going to um, begin by talking to you about what is paleolimnology, providing um, some of the, the questions and, and the, the interested parties um, who, who might use paleolimnology to, to inform their management decisions. Um, and then, and then how um, the, the, the sediments are accumulated that we work with and what they might contain and, and how they might inform us and, and specifically um, what, uh, why the diatoms are, are such a, a wonderful tool in the paleoanology toolbox. Then Mark is gonna talk about um, several uh, case studies, if you will, that try to highlight some of the different methods and, and techniques used uh, to incorporate diatoms in informing management through paleoanology. And then we'll sum everything up with, with a few uh, of our recommendations and some links to some resources. Next slide. Okay, so who who is infor, uh, who is interested in in managing their lakes and using paleoanology and why? Um, maybe we'll we'll start with the why. And um, you know, one of the top reasons is is water quality, but also maintaining fisheries and and believe it or not, sometimes property values are all uh, uh, some or, or a subset of the reasons of why people are interested in managing their lakes and and they're typically managing it for um, water chemistry constituents, um, water quality, and, and 
and the ecology of the lake. And here in Minnesota, we've had um, experience being in a lake rich region of the world, um, uh, helping state agencies like the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, local watershed districts, federal agencies like the uh, National Park Service, um, tribal nations, ho lake homeowner associations who are interested in their property values, environmental consulting firms, and then general scientific researchers um, are, are all folks that we've collaborated with on a, on a myriad of questions, again, from trying to um, judge the quality of their lake, see how their lakes may be impacted by um, local landscape changes, regional changes, um, global changes like climate change and, and atmospheric um, deposition. So there's really um, a wide variety of, of parties who, who, are, who, who can benefit from, from the information provided from lake sediment cores. Next slide. So to, to orient everybody, um, in case you're not familiar, um, lakes are, are a vastly complex ecosystem. Most of us just see the surface of the water. And most of the times I go out into a lake, the first thing I see for just a little bit is the surface of a water. And, and therefore, a lot of the, the intricacies within the ecosystem are not apparent to us. However, there's a whole food web and a suite of chemical and physical hydrologic processes that happen within a lake to make each lake a unique ecosystem um, from, from another one. Um, sure, there are lakes that are similar to each other, but in some way, many lakes all behave differently from, from one another if, if it's not in just some slight way. So there's a bunch of internal processes that can affect what is happening within a lake, and those internal processes can be driven by external things like landscape change, clearing the forest to, to make way for agriculture and um, industry effluent um, and residential effluent. Um, again, things like atmospheric deposition and, and changes in global temperature can all change the way that a lake behaves and functions. But ultimately, all of these lakes, however different and whatever might be impacting them, are all depositional environments. And it's, it's key that they're depositional environments to what we wanna do. And these depositional environments create a scenario where sediments are accumulated at the bottom of the lake, the, typically all over the lake, but generally the deepest part of the lake is, is one of the places that we like to look. And within these sediments, there are biotic and abiotic um, uh, fossils and, and proxies that, that get locked into the sediments and we rely on this happening in a conformable way. And what I mean by that is that the oldest sediments are at the, at the bottom of the sediment pile and, and the newest sediments are right at the surface um, at, the, at the bottom of the water. Every lake has sediments. Um, these sediments typically go back to the, the, the beginning of that lake. In Minnesota, for instance, um, there are lakes you can core and go back to when the glaciers disappeared um, in, in the sediment record. Um, and what we look for are all of these constituents that get trapped in the lake sediments of how they change, if they change. And, um, and we can use them as a measure if we've implemented management tools to see if the lakes are improving or, or the intended outcomes of our management tools. And, and, and that's really what can um, help, uh, that's really what helps paleoenology be a, a powerful tool to not only inform management decisions of how a lake has been, but also can show how it, if these management practices are, are, are working. Next slide, please. Um, here is just an example of some different coring advice, uh, devices we use to go get the mud um, from the bottom of the lake. And I was thinking about this, it's, it's, it's lake sediment and, and I will probably call it mud sometimes and that's like telling a geologist about dirt. They, and not to like that for soils, but I'll, I'll try to stick to sediments. Um, but just as you see a bunch of different coring devices here, um, you can have just as many, uh, if not a lot more, different kinds of lakes and different questions you might be asking in lakes. And ultimately, the, the type of coring device you use is driven by how much mud you would, how much sediment you would like to recover and, and how you can get to it. Sometimes a lake is so deep, it's not feasible to use a lot of these methods. Or like in the second photograph there of Mark using the gravity core, you may only need you know, 30 or 40 centimeters of mud to address your question. Um, next slide, please. 
So this is a series of animations and, and we'll, we'll try to work through it as best as we can to give you an idea of how lake sediments accumulate. Um, if you could go ahead and hit the advance button once. Um, we see a lake in a natural setting here um, with, with sediments coming into it um, from the landscape. Um, advance this. And, and also within the lake, we see particulate matter, both organic and, and inorganic, accumulating in the lake bottom. Um, advance, please. And even the diatoms end up getting trapped in these lake sediments down in the bottom. Um, next slide, please. On the right there, you can see some landscape change starting to occur. We have forest um, changing into agriculture and, and then some forest that was just cleared. And, and it's usually not as clear of a picture as shown in this animation, but the lake sediments begin to change. Um, next slide, please. And here we have further changes to the landscape and we see the, the ecology of the phytoplankton has changed to a little more cyanobacteria. And again, there are measures, um, which we often refer to as proxies, uh, becoming trapped in the lake sediment. Um, next, please. So here we go out in our boat. I wish we had a sailboat, but we, we uh, any boat will do. And, and we take our, our sediment core um, using one of the different methods. Um, advance, please. And so we drive the sediment core into the mud and uh, advance and, and we retrieve a, a vertical section of mud that hopefully has um, preserved these um, temporal layers of uh, different time periods of, of events in the lake's history. Next slide, please. Um, advance again. And so this is really the, the key piece, uh, advance. Of, of what we want to take away from the lake is, is this vertical section of mud advance one more time and and hopefully we have preserved the sediment layers again in a conformable way and meaning that the older sediments are on the bottom and the younger sediments are at the top and there hasn't really been any mixing. Um, the sediment core you see on the left is a really Beautiful sediment core showing a lot of change. Um, sometimes they're all just brown, but you know, one of the first things we do when we take a sediment core often on the boat or, or right on the shoreline is we, we do a description. And the most important thing is we record the length, the, 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 the depth of mud that we've recovered. We look for any kind of um, physical changes by looking at the color or any visible texture. We also look to see if there are any um, macro fossils like fish or, or plant fragments that are left in the mud that might inform us about the lake history at the time that that section was, was deposited. We then very carefully um, extrude the core by pushing the mud out of the sediment out of the tube and taking very thin slices. These slices can be half a centimeter thick, they can be up to two centimeters thick and, and probably even thicker in some other instances, but we generally work with half centimeter to centimeter two centimeter increments. And one of the things we're very careful to do, um, which Mark's daughter is demonstrating in the left photo here, is we like to trim the outside edge of our core because we know when we push the tube into the mud and also push the sediment out of the tube that um, some smearing can occur. So we really just want to get that nice um, lake sediment that's right in the center of the tube to, to prevent any temporal contamination. And once we have all of these little cups of lake sediment, we um, use our paleolimnological toolbox to, um, which, is, which is a very vast growing toolbox to, to look at the changes within these sediments. Next slide, please. One of the first things that we want to know when, when we retrieve a core is, is when were these sediments deposited? And a very useful way to do this is through isotopic dating. Um, many of you are probably familiar with carbon dating, and carbon dating is actually used on lake sediment cores on the 500 to 50,000 year time frame. In our lab, most of the questions we work with are within the 200 year time frame, and we use lead 210, which has a 12 and a half year um, half life and is, is detectable up to 200 years ago. Um, on the far right, we have a graph of a bunch of, of, of age depth profile. So depth is, is um, the top of the core is at the top of the graph. And as we go down, we see different curves. And it's okay that these curves um, have different slopes, but what's important is that the slope is always in the same direction. Sometimes a lake's 
uh, bottom can be subject to mixing, whether it's anchor drags or high winds. And we have a very useful tool um, from the above ground nuclear testing that happened in um, the 1950s and 60s and subsequently was stopped. Um, a byproduct of this was cesium-137. And so if we have some question in our core, we can at least double check our lead-210 dates by looking for a spike of cesium around the time of the 1950s and early 1960s. Next slide, please. Once we have a dated core, we can look at some other biogeochemical proxies. We can look at the percent organic or inorganic content of the, the, the core, um, which may tell us about the, the sediments from the watershed um, coming in and, and, and the source of those sediments coming into the lake and what's getting deposited in the bottom of the lake. We can use things like algae pigments and biogenic silica to measure algal productivity. And we can also use phosphorus fractionation to, to get a handle on how much external and internal loading of phosphorus is occurring in the lake. And one of the key things that we like to implement in, um, in paleolimnology is the use of multiple proxies because we want to use multiple lines of evidence to tell the same story since we weren't actually there to take the measurement. Advance to the slide, please. Um, in addition to the um, biogeochemical signals, there are, the, there, there are a lot of biological proxies um, we can look at. We can look at fish remains, um, diatoms, which we'll talk more about in a second, um, plant pollen remains. Um, the plant pollen can tell us about changes in the surrounding terrestrial landscape if the forest has been converted to agriculture or something like that. There are um, algae, um, fossils, uh, other than diatoms, there are um, fossils from silica, uh, from sponges, which might be an indication of how much silica is available in the lake. And something I'll talk a little bit more about towards the end of the talk is, is the use of, of finding DNA preserved in the sediment cores. Next slide, please. Um, so our main focus today is to talk about diatoms. And here is a brief example. You don't have to be a um, diatomist to, to maybe see the changes here on the left. We have um, a, a, a micrograph from a, a slide from the 1880s and a, and a micrograph from uh, more modern times um, on the right. And diatoms are these wonderful single-celled algae that are highly diverse and occur in almost every um, uh, aquatic ecosystem on the planet. And luckily for us, they are easily identifiable by their shape and ornamentation at the species level. And we can see that there has been a species composition change from the 1880s to the top of the core in the 1960s. Um, on the far right is a maybe a, um, a dumbed down version of, of what we might see where a, a type of diatom occurred at the bottom and slowly transitioned to another diatom. Maybe some management practice was implemented and the lake began to go back to, to the original community. Um, advance the slide, please. And go ahead, Mark. Okay, this is our this is our handoff. Thank you, thank you, David. What I'm going to talk about during the second part of our our uh, presentation here is how we use diatoms, and then how we can apply them to um, look at at water resource issues. Um, can you hit the next slide, please? So, when it's time to finally get our hands dirty with our mud, we need to think about sampling cleaning and getting on the microscope to analyze diatoms. David talked about sectioning our sediment cores. We can think about sectioning the sediment cores as, a, as what time frame we want to think about in the past. We might just do the top of the core and the bottom of the core to look at large scale changes that have occurred over decades or centuries. We might look analyze the entire core. One thing to know about diatoms is since they are made out of silica, we can typically use either wet mud or freeze-dried material without any uh, damage to the diatoms. Uh, typically we use freeze-dried material because it allows us to control how much sample we're going to be weighing out. For cleaning of diatoms we use standard oxidative techniques that we've we've all used for diatoms. Um, there was a very nice uh, diatom uh, news article in the uh, DONA website that you can look at summaries of different types of cleaning techniques. For mounting of our clean diatoms on the microscope slides, again, we use our standard techniques, which is usually involve uh, high index, uh, high, 
high index of refraction media such as NAFRAX or ZRAX. One choice we need to make when we're thinking about looking at diatoms is whether we want to look at them from a qualitative standpoint or a quantitative standpoint. In the picture here are a whole bunch of what are known as batter betrays. Um, batter betrays are one technique where we can look at quantitative um, preparation of diatoms so that we know exactly how many diatoms are found per gram of sediment. Um, they also make amazingly beautiful microscope slides with random distributions and we encourage their, encourage their use in this. Once we get our microscope slides made from our sediment levels, we get on the microscope and typically um, you want to use the best microscope you can with the best optics you can. So oil immersion, high, high numerical index uh, lenses. We usually count across transects on, on the microscope slides. The length of that transect, its location on the microscope is recorded. And quite often we use fixed counts. These are often 400 to 600 valve counts on our microscope slides. Um, there are techniques for um, deciding how much, uh, how, many, how many cells you might count to best capture, capture the diversity. And there's other techniques that we've discussed in other webinars, such as the O over E approach that may be used also for, um, uh, for analysis. For identification, um, diatoms of North America, DONA is a great site to, to begin working with. There's also uh, many different lab groups that do paleolimnology who have provided uh, floras or published floras on their things. These are groups like the, the John Small Lab, um, Ewan Reeves Lab, Pete Siver, Paul Hamilton's Lab, uh, Reinhard Peanuts. These are all people who have taken are, are really actively involved in sediment coring and are publishing their floras for others to use. Can I get the next slide, please? So what happens now that we've counted our diatoms? Typically, we, when we do counts, we generate uh, data that is based on relative abundance. What percentage of one species is there relative to the total number of, of, uh, uh, of valves we counted? Um, we can do, as I mentioned, absolute abundance. This is usually done as millions of diatoms per gram dry weight of sediment and can help us uh, decipher changes in productivity. In the end, what we're trying to generate is generally stratigraphic diagrams like you see at the left here, where the top of the core, the most recent material, is at the top of the graph, and we go down, in, down the uh, y-axis back in time with on the x-axis the relative or percent abundance of each species here. In this, in this graph, we can look at, you know, we can just look at it and see some of the changes that have occurred. At the bottom of the core, we can see a shift in the diatom community or diatom assemblage at the time of Euro-American settlement. And we go about halfway up that, that time sequence to the 1940s, and we can see another shift in this core at a time when agricultural practices changed uh, pretty dramatically in this region, as well as um, it became popular to put cottages around lakes. And these landscape level effects change, affect the diatoms in the, in the cores. We're also gonna talk about how we can start deciphering or finding structure in these types of data with um, clustering and ordination techniques. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some examples of top bottom approaches in cores. Um, we'll talk about whole core approaches and we'll end with some uh, new types of data that are coming out of these uh, out of core studies. Next one, please. To find structure in stratigraphic diatoms, one of the techniques we use is cluster analysis. Normally for uh, sediment cores, we use something called constrained cluster or conus. It's, it's constraining the analysis on time or depths in the core. Um, in this example, shown above, there's a red line that goes across at about 1980. In this lake, that was a time period when a wastewater treatment plant and a creamery that were discharging to this lake were, um, uh, their discharges were moved off, off away from the lake. And you can see that that's the most dramatic change that has occurred 
uh, in, the, in, the, in the history of, uh, in the 200 year history of this lake. Um, on the right hand side of the graph is a, is a line that also I just want to point out is, is one way to also think about uh, changes in lakes. It's, there's a, a plot of the percent of planktonic diatoms. In many of our shallow lakes, when we see these large bumps in planktonic diatoms, it's a, it's a, it's a change of state in these lakes when they've lost their macrophytes and plankton have, uh, have taken over. The other way we look for structure in sediment diagrams is using ordination techniques. On the right hand side here is an example of a, a non-metric multi-dimensional scaling graph where each uh, depth in the core is was represented by a point there. We can see a, a large shift that occurs in the 1950s and 1960s in this lake and in this particular case it was a time period of the end of logging and again uh, the uh, uh, development of, of cottages around these around this lake that uh, controlled sort of the largest jump in this in this lake. Next slide. One of the techniques that's that's uh, that's still widely used for considering change in cores are the use of transfer functions or calibration uh, sets. These are generally used something known as weighted averaging calibration and regression. And what the goal of these techniques is to first identify diatom responses that can be significantly and independently explained by environmental variables. Why this is important is most of our management techniques are not interested in how diatoms are managed, but they're interested in how things that we often measure in water quality, like total phosphorus or pH or salinity might be measured. So what we want to be able to do is to, can we take a modern or a fossil diatom community and use it to predict or construct that water quality variable of interest? I'm gonna talk about a couple, an example that we've used in Minnesota where over a hundred lakes have been studied to develop phosphorus models. Let me just give a little more detail on how this uh, calibration technique works. Can I get the next slide? What we do is we, starting at the top of that graphic, what we typically do is study um, the modern distribution of diatoms over many, many lakes in a, in a region. Um, it might be 50 lakes, it might be 70, it might be more than 100 lakes. In each of those lakes, we measure the diatom community that's living there. We measure contemporary water chemistry variables or contemporary physical chemistry variables that are, might be controlling those diatoms. And then we explore those data to try to identify where independent and significant um, vari how, how environmental variables can independently and significantly explain the distribution of diatoms. When we've identified those, we can use them uh, to develop models. The models are based on species responses. Those uh, smooth curves there are um, showing the optima and tolerance of various diatom species, which are used in developing these weighted averaging models to predict, again, a water quality variable based on, uh, based on the diatom assemblages that's preserved there. The technique is, has been, has been um, scrutinized in recent years, and I wanna encourage people to look at some of the more recent papers that are listed at the bottom there to understand the limitations and um, uh, recommendations for applying these techniques. Can I get the next slide, please? One of the techniques, one of the ways that this technique has been used is in the development of phosphorus standards for U.S. Lake. The U.S. EPA has asked uh, states in the country to develop phosphorus standards for our water bodies. And when waters exceed those standards, it's how we define a lake or river as impaired. And when a lake is impaired, a plan must be put in place to return those to compliance. The Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, where I live, has set phosphorus standards for different ecoregions of Minnesota and different lake types using these, uh, this, using paleolimnological evidence, including diatoms. Next slide. Minnesota's got a, uh, a wide range of landforms and ecoregions from the northern lakes and forests up in the northeast part of the, the state to 
prairie regions and agricultural regions down in the southwest part of the state. What we did is took cores from over 70 of these lakes, um, analyzed the dated the cores, analyzed the core top to assess the modern condition of the lake and develop our, our calibration set, and sampled below the Euro-American settlement horizon to understand what the lakes were like back in time. In each of these things, we estimated the total phosphorus using the diatom, the diet, using diatom inferred total phosphorus. Next slide. And these data inform standards for Minnesota. Um, these, the plots are set up here where in pairs, where the blue line is pre-European settlement, the green line is the modern condition of these lakes, and we can see several different patterns here. Starting on the left, the northern lakes in forests, you can see that the lakes had lower total phosphorus before Europeans arrived on the landscape, and in comparison to the prairie lakes on the right-hand side of the graph, the prairie lakes were much higher productivity even back in time. We also see that the modern conditions of the lake vary across these, across these, these, uh, this, this geographic range. What the state of Minnesota did, next slide please, is they proposed standards based on these data, so paleoimmunological diatom data, runoff models, as well as reference condition lakes, for each of these different ecoregions, and in some ecoregions separating deep lakes from shallow lakes. What this does is it provides us a, a ruler, a measuring stick of how we might um, think of the, the health of our, of, of our lakes. Next slide, please. How might we use these types of information? We might wanna prioritize where we spend our management dollars. Just west of the Minneapolis-St. Paul region is a large lake called Lake Minnetonka that's in a, in a watershed that's very, very water rich. We took sediment cores from about 20 different uh, lakes or embayments in this region and did a top bottom analysis of them, including uh, estimation of what the phosphorus values were, to try to understand how these lakes had changed over time. Each pair of dots, the top dot is the current condition, the bottom dot is the pre-Euro-American condition, and we can see several different patterns. Some of the lakes, the ones that have two blue dots, haven't changed that much. It's a place where we don't probably need to spend our, our resource or our, our management dollars. Other lakes, like the one at the upper, upper right, Gleason Lake, clearly that lake, pre-European, was a was, had much better phosphorus conditions, and this is a type of lake that may best respond to, our, to, remedi to using those remediation dollars. So these are ways that we might take paleolimnological information in a regional setting and use it to prioritize how we spend our money. Next slide. Other ways that we can use the sediment record in diatoms is to understand how lakes are recovering from management that has been put in place. Lake of the Woods is a very large lake that's on the border of Minnesota, Ontario, and Manitoba. So it's an international boundary borders water. And one of the things that occurred is back in the 1970s, with the uh, passage of the Clean Water Act, there was um, large efforts made to curtail the total phosphorus load that was coming down the main river to this lake from wastewater treatment plants and industry. That load was curtailed dramatically. In the left-hand graph, you can see that. And what we're interested in how that uh, management action affected this lake. What we found is that it had, it, it, it did affect somewhat the, the, how, the, how the lake, the total phosphorus in the, in the sediment was recorded. Uh, that center graph is our diatom inferred total phosphorus. But we can also see that it, even though we've dramatically um, reduced that phosphorus loading, the lake has continued to remain relatively high in phosphorus. And the reason is, is because there is a huge phosphorus load sitting in the sediments of this lake that's still being 
circulated and still being loaded into the lake to continue the productivity of this lake. Climate change is also probably affecting it. In the end, um, we're getting close. Uh, the lake is, is getting closer to, to meeting its standard, um, and hopefully we can take it off our impaired waters list at some time. Next slide, please. Any environmental conditions that control diatoms, these traits that diatoms have, can be utilized to, to, uh, in, in, in a paleolimnological setting. Where diatoms grow is important, the lake depth. Um, here's a study that we did in uh, northern Wisconsin, where we took 15 short sediment cores from throughout a lake at all different depths and looked at the diatoms that were living in, the, in living at in each of those each of those areas of the lake. What we learned is that water depth controls where diatoms grow in the lake, and because that we are able to use that to develop a model to predict what, how that lake depth has changed over time. In this case, we were very interested in modern conditions of that lake. The lake has got a very low water level, and we were wondering if that was just normal or within the typical variation of that lake. So we took a core that went back about 3,000 years, and we can see that back in the late Holocene wet period, the lake was much, much higher, four to six meters deeper than it is today, and that the lake had dropped over the course of the uh, medieval climate anomaly, other smaller changes, and including the Anthropocene have affected the lake level. Um, but we haven't seen in recent years the, what, the types of conditions that were present during that late Holocene wet period. Next slide, please. Diatoms can also be, diatoms are, are considered aquatic invasive species sometimes. On the left hand side of the screen is uh, some uh, plots from sediment cores from our North American Great Lakes. There's two diatom species, Actinocyclus normanii and Stephanodiscus binderanus, where the sediment records from uh, these various Great Lakes clearly record the introduction of these species into the Great Lakes. Um, do these diatoms have effects on the Great Lakes? Well, it turns out they do. For example, Stephanodiscus binderanus um, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a big, uh, uh, can clog uh, filters for water intakes that are working around the lakes and, and places like the city of Chicago needed to update their water intakes to, to uh, to, to react to that. The other thing that's interesting about these sediment records is they record when these diatoms were introduced, but one thing we often find is that the monitoring programs that are in place on these lakes don't pick these diatoms up right away. Either they're not in abundance or the analysts are simply not aware of these potential invaders coming into the lakes. Sometimes diatoms can be used to prove that things aren't aquatic invasive species. In a recent paper um, by Sarah Spaulding, and I saw Jeffrey Stone was on, on, online here too, um, from Beauty Lake, Wyoming, up near Yellowstone National Park, they took a long sediment core covering 14,000 years um, that showed that Didymosphenia geminata was present in Beauty Lake 10,000 years ago, so that it's introduction into this habitat was not a new phenomenon, but that it had, that the habitat was, uh, uh, was, it was, it was, it was a place where Didymosphenia could live long ago. Next slide, please. I'm going to turn it back to David now. All right. Thank you, Mark. Um, as, Mar as Mark was mentioning, in Minnesota, there are nutrient standards and criteria for, um, well, both the rivers, but, you know, here our focus is on the lakes. And sometimes those um, bodies of water can exceed the nutrient standards. And there's two courses of, react, uh, of action. Um, one is to pursue remediation and try to um, reduce those, um, those levels, be it um, chlorophyll A or, or phosphorus in the instance that I'm about to provide to you. Or we can create a site-specific standard where we raise the standard for that specific body of water. 
Um, here we are looking at Upper and Lower Red Lake and um, North Central Minnesota, the largest water body within the state of Minnesota. And um, in the bottom, what we can see is a false colored satellite image of a cyanobacteria bloom. In recent years, cyanobacteria have been more frequently reported from Upper Red Lake. And coupling this with the um, last 20 years of monitoring data, which you see on the right side, um, you can see total phosphorus on the top and, and chlorophyll A on the bottom. And the red line indicates the, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency standard that over those last 20 years, generally both of these parameters have exceeded the, um, the nutrient standards. So the lake managers, both the, the, the Red Lake Nation um, Tribal DNR and the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency were, were interested to see if paleoimmunological evidence might reveal if this has always been happening in the lake. Next slide, please. Um, on the left, we have a ordination, um, and a non-metric multi-dimensional scaling plot of five sediment cores, two from upper uh, Red Lake on the left and three from lower Red Lake on the right. And what you really need to take away from here is that um, the lines are, are connected points between the different um, increments and the sediment core in a continuous path starting with the oldest dated sediments to the most modern dated sediments. And, and the main takeaway here, while we do see uh, a slightly different community in Upper Red Lake than we do in Lower Red Lake, is that that line kind of circles back and forth over itself on time. And this gives us an indication that there were no um, big community shifts um, uh, and, and we're kind of looking at the normal variability um, within the lake and we haven't seen any major changes. Um, using these diatom data, we also constructed diatom inferred phosphorus models using um, one of our transfer functions that was developed for the state of Minnesota. On the right side, you can see an estimation plot showing the distribution and, uh, of, of the uh, diatom inferred data on the right side of, of the, the blue, green, purple, orange, and yellow dots. And then the red dots are that last 20 years of total phosphorus monitored data in milligrams or micrograms per liter. And one of the, the, the big takeaways right away is almost every, uh, most of the samples from the monitored data, as well as all the diatom inferred data are above that standards of 30 micrograms per liter. Um, we see large variability in the monitor data over the last 20 years, and we see uh, much more constrained variability but in, in the diatom inferred phosphorus from those sediment cores. But note that, that um, even that constrained variability is well within the range of the variability we have seen over the last 20 years. So given the, um, ecological um, community evidence that there has not been a large change and that the total phosphorus values um, uh, that are estimated for the past fall within what we see today. Upper and lower Red Lake are, are likely candidates for a, uh, a lake site-specific standard. Um, and, and again, just as a, as a way to use paleoimmunology as a tool to inform um, modern management decisions. Um, next slide, please. Um, next, I'm going to talk about very briefly um, the use of, of DNA and some, some new tools in the paleoimmunology toolbox. Um, here's a study that was conducted in East Africa um, to, to kind of get a handle on lake level in Lake Navasha and Kenya. And the authors here use both morphological and DNA evidence. And I, I must point out as a, as a recommendation that the pairing of both of these methods is, is, is very crucial, especially as, as we're just starting to use DNA. Um, they took a sediment core and reconstructed the diatom history over the last 200 years. And in the morphology, we see um, lower abundance of Olicocyra in the lake's history and um, a, a, a blip of abundance of navicula um, in the 1800s. The, the navicula disappear and we see an increasing dominance in the oligocyra. Interestingly enough, while the changes aren't directly proportional, we see a similar shift and or we, they saw a similar shift in the DNA. 
Um, they used um, RBCL as, as the target gene to, to get a genus level resolution with their DNA. And they saw the same shift from maybe more benthic species to an increase in the planktic species, suggesting an um, increase in, in lake level. Next slide, please. Um, the, um, the same research group um, implemented paleogenomics again. This is environmental DNA. Um, and they used uh, RBCL to target a, a single species of, of diatom, Starocyra venter. And instead of looking at genus level shifts, they looked at within species variability. And I'm not sure that within species variability is something that a lot of diatomists have been thinking about. Um, but what they revealed is they took some surface sediment cores along the tree line in Siberia, and they identify different strains of Starocyra venter living above and below the tree line, mostly related to the vegetation that was growing um, around the lake. Um, and so they, they use this data to sort of create a um, pseudo DNA transfer function model, though that's not what they said they did, it's just the way I'm encapsulating it. Um, and they use the knowledge of these different strains living above and below the tree line to and apply them to a sediment core for on a lake taken now above the tree line. And what the evidence suggests, coupled with, with pollen data, is that strains that were more prevalent within the tree line used to inhabit the lake um, several thousands of years ago. And, and it's suggestive of a shift of the tree line um, can be seen in the shift in the strains uh, of, of diatoms. And um, this is a, a, a really fascinating study because looking at the variability within a species adds a much finer tooth comb possibly to the, to the paleolimnological toolbox. Um, very, very fascinating. Um, next slide, please. Um, one other emerging field along with environmental DNA is the field of resurrection ecology. And there's really only been one resurrection ecology study done with diatoms. And there are, including diatoms, there are several organisms that create these very robust resting states that end up in the lake sediments. And what we found is these resting stages can be revived up to over 100 years ago. Um, diatoms have been resuscitated from, from the lake mud um, if we give them the right amount of nutrients and, and sunlight. And we can revive those specific diatoms or, or other organisms even and, and conduct common garden experiments and, and look at the, the actual functionality of the genomics um, that we're, we're seeing in the sediment record to, to not just infer changes in the past, but, but actually demonstrate them through laboratory ecology. Um, the one study that has been conducted was by Harnström et al. and um, Fjord of, and a Fjord of Sweden. Um, again, they found Skeletonema maurii viable from over 100 years ago, and they were investigating whether or not a fjord population had been interacting with an open water population. In the cluster analysis at the top of the screen, you can see clear separation of, of the open water Skeletonema at the bottom with the Skeletonema from the fjord at, at, the, at the top in that first major break in the cluster. And another way to look at that is to see the, the green and red bars here representative of the, the genomic sequences of the fjord uh, skeletonema on the left and the open water sequences on uh, open water skeletonema on the right. And, and we just did not, they did not see any mixing of, of the skeletonema populations throughout the, the history of the fjord, fjord sediment core. Um, the, both of these are uh, eDNA and, and um, resurrection ecology and in, in, in sediment cores are two um, flourishing fields. There's a, a suite of review papers I've provided just to begin some conversations if you have them interested by um, Domaison, um, Mark and I published a paper and, and a recent one just came out um, by Elgard et al. in 2020. And, and, um, please feel free to reach out to us if you have questions, more questions about this as it's a budding field and, and also check out these papers. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Mark and the next slide so he can um, 
summarize and give you some recommendations from what we've talked about today. Now we just want to wrap up the wrap up our our webinar today with some recommendations and and resources that people might reach out to 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 think about uh, using diatoms and paleolimnology. Next slide, please. Um, first, as we think about uh, interpreting sediment records, one of the things that's really important is to think about the power in what's known as multi-proxy studies that diatoms are but one signal that's preserved in sediments and if we can look at multiple signals that are preserved in sediments you're going to get a much stronger interpretation of ecological changes that have occurred. Um, another um, tool that we can use is to consider linking neolimnology and paleolimnological studies. Can we understand um, how species responses in modern sense can be used to interpret these uh, paleolimnological changes that have occurred in, 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 uh, in sediment cores? I reach out to Jasmine Saros's lab for good, good efforts on that. Um, we talked about Batterby preps as a, as a really good tool for making excellent slides. We talked a little bit about how we might work with um, identifying our diatoms, whether it's using diatoms.org or also uh, talking about vouchers, voucher approaches. Haven't been used much for sediment cores, but I think we're gonna end up going there. For statistical analysis, most of it's now done in the R package using a couple different tools, uh, the Vegan and Rioja packages uh, for analyzing our diatom data. And last, I want to just talk about the fact that we are doing science here. So we need to think about backing up our data through archiving. And um, one of the tools that can be used for that is located on the other, other column there. Uh, LACCOR is a facility at the University of Minnesota that provides core and uh, sediment archiving. The Neotoma database, the second link there, is a place where data can be preserved for sediment cores. For some of the tools that we use, including dating of cores, you might reach out to the St. Croix Watershed Research Station where lead 210 and cesium-137 dating is, is completed. Uh, for carbon dating, most of it's done down at the Arizona lab at that link. And an, a final tool that I wanted to recommend is the uh, TMI tool that's also at, uh, hosted at LACCOR which provides a number of tutorials on how, um, the, how you, might, you might just take a quick look at your diatoms and, and try to understand the patterns of change that are occurring in your sediment cores. Next slide, please. Um, we're gonna end here with uh, the next uh, couple slides have um, some of the references that we've had here. You can go to the next slide, please. And we've also provided um, uh, David and my uh, email addresses if, if people want to reach out further in that regard. Is there even one more slide? I think there's, there's, nope, that was it. So we'd be happy to entertain any questions in the final minutes of our webinar here if people have them. Thank you, Mark and David, very much for the excellent presentation. Um, we do have a question in the chat from Hannah. Um, she uh, put in this question when you were talking about the diatoms that live in deeper um, lake levels or shallow lakes. Um, what model or method was used to reconstruct the lake levels? Um, we, 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 that was done with a simple weighted averaging model, Hannah, um, where uh, we, we used ordination techniques to identify that depth was the strongest determinant of, of the distribution of those diatoms and then used weighted averaging to reconstruct the, the levels. Okay, um, more questions are coming in. Uh, Cindy asks, here in Texas, our lakes are much younger, less than 100 years, um, a lot of reservoirs. So what considerations would there be for looking at diatoms in these young systems? Um, re reservoirs, re reservoirs provide a challenge for um, paleolimnology because they oftentimes have uh, highly variable sedimentation rates that may be seasonal, they may be sporadic, they may be flood-based. Um, 
they oftentimes uh, finding dating models to apply to sediment cores, uh, reservoir cores is, is a challenge. Um, I'm not going to discourage you from trying it, but just recognize that it's, it's, it's not as, uh, as straightforward as we sometimes find in, um, in lakes that are, are, are older and, more, and formed through, through natural processes. You will be able to find diatoms preserved in reservoir sediments, though. Uh, Camilo asks, do you know if there's um, a development of any tool to reconstruct harmful algal blooms in lakes? Um, two, two, two techniques that, or I'll say three techniques that have been used in this. Uh, early on, um, there were uh, good efforts put forth on identifying fossils of cyanobacteria in in sediment cores. This is usually done by identifying aconites, which can be identified to the species level. Uh, I, would, I would reach towards uh, especially work by Hetty Kling in that regard. Um, sediment pigments are the, the primary marker that's used for looking at changes in cyanobacterial communities in, in lakes. Um, several labs work with those and can identify different groups of, of uh, cyanobacteria and how they've changed over time. And last, there is um, efforts to look for both toxins that are preserved in sediments and the genetic signatures that are preserved in sediments. And if you reach out to us, we can, we can point you in the right direction for, for those, those studies. We have a couple questions here about Batterby chambers. Are they available commercially? Um, are there any descriptions available for making them yourself? Um, the, the, I would say the only place that probably tells you or how to, how to make them is the original article by Rick Batterby from about 1973 in Limnology and Oceanography. Um, I know there's several labs that make them. Sarah, where are you getting yours these days? I was able to take those instructions from uh, the Batterby paper. There, it's very well documented about what the specs are and go down to the local um, plastics shop that works with plexiglass and, and have them made. It was really pretty straightforward. We have a good question here. Um, what about diatom fragments and how do you account for the potential different preservation across different species as a source of bias in estimating relative abundances? Um, these are choices you get to make as an analyst when, when working, on, working on sediment cores. I would say that generally people tend to count diatoms that are found in 50% or greater and can be identified to a species in their counts. Um, there are certain diatoms that fragment very easily and oftentimes we use um, specialized counting techniques. For instance, the, the genus Asteria nella often breaks in sediment cores and so we only count the, the, the big end of the Asteria, of the Asteria nella. Um, that isn't, isn't that doesn't mean you can't estimate or count every fragment that's out there. We've, I've done studies in, on that as well to, to generate uh, true absolute abundances of diatoms in sediment cores. But generally, a lot of the techniques involve a choice and typically counting fragments that are 50% or greater. This question might be for David. Um, Dormant cells um, in the sediment core, could they influence the DNA signal and make the signal stronger? I think that's a wonderful question. Um, and I, I, I don't have an answer for you. I, I, I can only make assumptions about it, but some of the initial research we we're doing on um, DNA in sediment cores, one of the things we noticed along with diatoms being well-preserved in, in sediment cores, is we also see a lot of chrysophyte DNA, which also makes a very robust resting stage. So I can only imagine that these resting stages or these preserved cells in the sediments are going to influence the 
overall or absolute abundance of DNA for these taxa that you find in the sediment cores. It's, it's something to, to measure and, and science for the coming years to get a grip on. All right. Do either of you know if there are um, any databases to um, help facilitate um, identification of teratologies in diatoms due to heavy metal pollution? I, I am not aware of any databases that, uh, that, that, are, that are out there that to, to, to address that. I would say it would, you'd probably have to you know, go back to the, the actual primary literature where these types of uh, teratologies have been shown for various species of diatoms. Are there any voucher flora um, available for the sediment diatoms, especially for Asia and Africa? This question comes from Karthik. Mm. Um, I, I know that there's a, a number of, of um, groups that have published floras um, around, I know that, you know, there's papers from around Lake Baikal uh, that, have, that have talked about some of the Asian, the Asian floras there. I know that there's papers coming out of China that talk about sediment core floras as well. Um, I think it would have to, you'd have to reach out to, to more regional um, researchers to find out who has put together those resources. I talked a little bit about some of the groups in, the, in North America who have made efforts to um, uh, document their floras for others to use. I have one more question. Um, how do you um, decide how many cores you're going to take from a lake? And how do you know those cores represent the lake? Um, I, think, I think that, that, that question is, um, is, is based primarily on uh, the question you're asking, you know, what, what you want to learn about a lake. Um, in general, as, as David mentioned, sediments are deposited throughout the lake. So you might, so for instance, the, the study that we did on depth in a lake, we didn't take that core from the middle of the lake. We actually took it over towards the side of the lake where changes in depth might be better recorded. Um, generally for, for us, the number of cores reflect the uh, diversity of habitats within the lake and the size of the lake. So bigger lakes oftentimes get more, have more variable water quality issues around them. So we might take more cores. Um, and the other thing is, uh, your other thing you asked about was how you know if one is enough. Um, that's why, um, that's, that's why your, your initial coring location and initial analysis of your core, both the physical analysis of it, description of it, and especially your your dating is going to start picking up anomalies. And yes, you sometimes have to go take a new core. <laughs> Thank you. I think that is it for the questions. Thanks, everybody. I love the um, pictures of everyone here. Um, I see folks working on the microscope. <laughs> <laughs> Um, doing the question session. Um, so it's great to see. Great to see everybody. Thanks everyone for joining us. I'd like to echo that. Um, thank you, David and Mark for a really informative presentation. And I really appreciate being able to get together with everyone. We're also isolated in our homes. And this is really a bright spot to be able to get together and continue to learn and make connections within our field. And I'd just like to reach out to anyone who would be interested in sharing their work. We have thought about um, some different types of topics for these sessions, um, whether they're directed at managers or focusing on genus level, um, studies like Marina Potapova's on Planethidium and having more of those sort of analyst and taxonomist uh, directed talks, as well as um, instructions on how do you really manipulate a lot of images and deal with them.
So um, let us know. You can reach out to Sylvia or myself or anything through any of us through the um, diatoms.org contact list or anybody's email. Um, and thanks everyone for staying home and for hanging in there. Um, be well. Bye everybody. Thanks Sarah, thanks Sylvia. Thanks David. <laughs>